Okay, welcome back to Social 375. This is Chapter 2. And in Chapter 2, we're talking about the two major philosophies um, and purposes for research. And when we say philosophies, we're really talking about perspectives about what the researcher or the research community believes. So you may have learned about these ideas in other classes, inductive versus deductive. You may have also heard uh, referred heard them referred to in more methodological ways. You may have heard people talk about quantitative methods versus qualitative methods. And inductive and deductive and quantitative and qualitative are not exactly the same things. There's distinctions between them. But for the purposes in this class, you'll find that inductive research is aligned with qualitative research and deductive methods are aligned with quantitative research. So what does that mean? So inductive really has uh, the idea that you go into a situation before you have an explanation, right? So you have a question. Why are people doing what they're doing? Why does some group act this way? Why is some problem existing? But in your head, you really don't have an answer uh, formulated. You don't have a hypothesis. The, the base question is, I don't know why this is happening and I'm going to get as much information as I can and hopefully that will help me develop a hypothesis uh, of what's going to happen. Deductive research, deductive reasoning is the opposite. You see a problem or a circumstance and you speculate that the reason that something is happening is because of a certain situation. So for example, you may say, uh, my hypothesis is that people are more depressed in rural communities when they don't have access to traditional foods. That's your hypothesis. And then you would go out and test that hypothesis to either prove it true or not be able to prove it true. Different than asking the question in an inductive way, saying, I wonder why people in rural communities seem more depressed. Um, and that would be an inductive way of framing the question. So as I mentioned, deductive research is similar to quantitative research. And you can remember quantitative because it has to do with quantities. Quantities, numbers, uh, are a, a, a key way in which people look at things quantitatively. So studies that look at the analysis of numbers, percentages, averages, uh, those kinds of things, uh, those are quantitative methods. Uh, like we mentioned, it's primarily used in the deductive reasoning. So if your hypothesis was that uh, people are more depressed because they don't have access to their traditional foods, then you would count the number of people that agreed with the statement and the number of people that disagreed with the statement, and you'd be able to make some generalizable statements about its truth or non-truth. Um, so in that sense, it's also structured and quantifiable, right? We ask people to say yes or no. And it's not that simple in research design. It's a simplified example for this lecture. But in essence, you are, in quantitative research, asking people to commit to an answer. It's not open-ended. Um, and the benefits of quantitative research are that, that these can be more accurate and standardized because numbers are easy to group together and organize and see order. We can make more um, standardized statements about percentages when we collect quantitative data. On the other side of the philosophical frame is the idea of qualitative research, qualitative methodology. And just like the name implies, we're looking at the quality, uh, the depth of the information that we gather, not the numbers per se. So when you see qualitative methodology, you are looking for words uh, rather than numbers. You're looking for content, uh, language that can be distilled into themes, uh, understandings, and ideas, but not necessarily numbers. And as we mentioned earlier, this is primarily used in inductive research. So if we go back to our, our um, research question we discussed on the last slide, why, are, why do more people seem to be depressed in rural communities? We don't have a presupposed idea. 
And so we would go out and ask the question. We might ask all kinds of open-ended questions about depression. And from the answers that we get, um, we would tease out some hypotheses about what might be going on. So hypothesis comes in the end of qualitative methodology. Um, so what, what one of the limitations of qualitative methodology is that this can't be generalized specifically to larger populations because you work in small numbers with uh, maybe very specific groups. You can't take that research and say, well, if people in small communities in Alaska are more depressed because of this reason, then that will hold true for people who are more depressed in other communities. It's not necessarily generalizable. Um, but there's lots of ways that you can collect qualitative uh, information. So you can do it through interviews and open-ended questions. You can do it through observations of behaviors and interaction. So there are uh, uh, a variety of tools for collecting qualitative data, and they're very different than the ways that we collect quantitative data. A third, and then maybe even arguably best way to collect information about a particular topic is through mixed methodology. And mixed methodology is exactly what it sounds like, where you mix quantitative and qualitative data collection in a way that provides you the most information. So going back to our example, if we noticed or think there might be increased rates of depression in rural communities in Alaska, a mixed methods research study would ask both the numerical questions, what's your level of depression on a scale, what's your um, <clears throat> rate of depression, how, what do you say are the number of months that you've been depressed, and then we look at percentages of people that are indicating they're depressed, right? That's all quantitative data. But then we'd be interested in the why. Why are people reporting? Um, if people say it's because of uh, limitations in cultural practices, what does that mean? What kinds of limitations are people experiencing? And the only way to really get at that information is through qualitative data collection. So a mixed method study would include quantitative and qualitative. And uh, the idea is that you can triangulate, right? You can come at a question from more than one angle. And the more that you cover it, the more accurate you pinpoint it. And that's the idea of triangulation. Um, when quantitative and qualitative data match up, that is when they say relatively the same thing or they point in the same direction, you have a much stronger convincing argument that you found something meaningful in your data, and that is triangulation. Your chapter also talks briefly about uh, three areas of uh, more specialized research focus. This has to do with uh, philosophical framework, beliefs, as well as methods. The first one they talk about is participatory action research, and this has been a model of research that recognizes um, that research is not, should not be particularly with the press community, should not be a top-down experience. So participatory action research says individuals should not go into a community uh, from outside, collect that information, uh, and then leave with that information. That instead, um, participants in the issue, in the concern, should play an active and leading role in the data collection, in the setting of the research agenda, in the asking of the research of questions. Feminist research uh, is, is what it sounds. It's a, a research uh, perspective that looks specifically at uh, issues from a gender perspective and um, challenges through research some of the institutionalization of gender oppression. Um, and that's a specific category as well as a philosophy of research. And Afrocentric research is similar and that the perspectives start from a place of uh, examining oppression that's specific to a population and uh, using those philosophies to guide that research agenda. So we're going to talk a lot this semester about critical thinking in research. Critical thinking is really important. This is where you take, you take in what is said to you, you uh, think about and mull over and decide what your own personal thoughts and reactions are to that information. So it's not agreeing automatically with information that's putting in front of you. It's thinking through it logically, thinking about how it applies to your community um, before you decide to accept or reject or hold and wait on particular information. 
So critical thinking in the sense of research involves clarifying what is our, what's the goal of our research and being very clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, uh, uh, ethics, and we'll talk again more later about some of the particular ethics related to research participants. And then critical review produced by others. This is the idea that you would take your research for feedback to other individuals. And uh, the idea of the peer-reviewed process, that research is improved by uh, openly and honestly communi communicating how we collected the information, who we collected it from, and uh, helping, having others help us look for flaws in our process.